And I thought women are going to be all over the restaurant industry because my, the women models I had in my own life were grandmothers that cooked the food, yeah. not grandfathers. Yeah, so never. I was like, where are all the women? Yeah. <laughs> The New Jersey Innovation Institute is the conduit that connects one of the nation's leading polytechnic institutions, New Jersey Institute of Technology, to the outside world. Created to leverage the vast resources of NJIT, the New Jersey Innovation Institute is focused on fostering innovation, building companies, and upskilling New Jersey's workforce. NJI employs over 100 people and generates over $35 million in revenue per year in industries such as defense and healthcare. To learn more about the innovative strides being taken at the New Jersey Innovation Institute, head to NJII.com. Entrepreneurs and small business owners, are you feeling overwhelmed by lack of capital, growth challenges, or personal branding? You are not alone. UCS Advisors is here for you. We're professional capital raising advisors committed to helping you secure funding and grow your business. Are you ready to impress investors? Check your investor readiness with our free 45-second quiz at UCSQuiz.com. We believe in you. Visit UCSQuiz.com and start your success journey. And remember, always be willing to achieve your greatness. We're so happy to announce our brand new partnership with the New Jersey Lottery. As their slogan goes, anything can happen in Jersey, and that is so true. Welcome to Greetings from the Garden State, powered by the New Jersey Lottery. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Reading from the Garden State. I'm your host, Mike Cam. We are here in Long Branch, New Jersey today at the Whitechapel Projects with Marilyn Schlossbach. Marilyn, welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for having me. And I told you off mic before, so like other chefs and people that we've had on the show prior to me finally getting down here, like your name always kind of seems to kind of like come up in conversation. I was like, I remember uh, staying at the St. Laurent and seeing your book in there, like in like one of the stacks of books in one of the rooms. And it was just like, Marilyn, Marilyn, Marilyn. I was like, I got to finally get Marilyn on the show. So I'm really excited to get you on. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's what happens when you're old. <laughs> People see you more. <laughs> yeah, but no, I mean, it's there's a reason because I just think that like, you know, like this place, and I told you before too, is like been a place that I haven't gotten to, but it has been like one of the top three places I was like, I need to get there because it just seems like a, such a cool spot and like a cool environment with a lot of like different eclectic type things going on. Um, so could we just like talk about Whitechapel real fast, just so people, if, if they don't know what this place is, uh, like just kind of like a broad strokes overview of what Whitechapel is. Okay. So I don't even know what Whitechapel is at this <laughs> which point. Is the, which is the cool thing about it, yes. you know? Um, you know, the intention here, my partner, Preston, who founded the Whitechapel Projects. Uh, he worked in London in the Whitechapel District. So that's where the overreaching name comes from. Okay. But out of his window in his office was the Tate Modern Museum. So if you go online and you look at Tate, looks very similar to this building. Yeah. And he drove by, saw this building, had subsequently seen me speak at the Stone Pony in a Women Who Rock event. Cool about following your dreams and going after the things you want in life and life is too short and you only remember it once yeah. and right. just do it and kind of did it. But, you know, not for nothing. Uh, it's funny, we were having this conversation this week because we were down, we have a home in the Dominican Republic and okay. we were down there surfing this week and we were talking about how people get into hospitality not knowing anything about it and think it's like fun and yeah. talking to people and enjoying all the things. And in the reality, the people behind the scenes are not the ones enjoying all the things right. all the time. <laughs> they're, they're trying to make sure you enjoy them. Yeah. And it's, it's definitely one of the hardest things to get involved in doing food and beverage sure. in general. And even more so now. So Preston, you know, was having a tough time with it. And he was a customer. And we got to know each other. And I always loved this space. I always felt like it was underutilized for events in particular, mm -hmm. which to me are more appealing now because they're more controllable yeah. than that day-to-day. -day you don't know what's going to come at you. Right. Um, not weather driven, not uh, event driven, like you know next year what you've got on the books yeah. and that's 
kind of a nice feeling. Totally. At some <laughs> like point in life. The numbers you kind of like can yeah. forecast a little bit better. Yeah. 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 Like this year, I'm like, wow, I don't have to worry about the weather. Yeah. That's, a, that's an amazing thing. Yeah. I'm but just because, like, oh, which how much outdoor space there is here. Like, yeah. the courtyard is so cool. I was, like, standing there before I saw the arrow to the door that I should have walked in at the beginning. Um, like, that's, like, a cool spot. Yeah. And then, like, obviously, you just showed me outside back here. And, like, I'm sure, you know, right now it's cool with the tent back there. But I'm sure in the summer, probably awesome yeah. to, to do some stuff back there and enjoy all the different things. Because there's, like, there's pizza there's right now there's beer there's all sorts of stuff right yeah. here yeah so the project's name um really is there for me and since i've come on board to create these collaborative things and spaces whether it's art music guest chefs coming in and doing their thing here somebody doing cookie class somebody making malas yeah. a market a surf market you know I think now that I'm older, I'm not as concerned with being the top dog. Like you are when you're younger, like you feel like you have to prove yourself and you like always have day, to be yeah. like going on this hamster yeah. wheel and being the next thing people talk about. Now I just want to help people do what they want to do. Yeah. And I have the space to do it and partners that are behind that vision of having projects in here and not always having to be the one to do the thing. Right. You know, so my goal is to just invite all kinds of cool people into this space to do what they are passionate about and yeah. build their business yeah. around that. That's really cool. And I love the, I, I mean, just, it's uh like, I like that because that's kind of like when I started this show, it's like a very similar type thing. Like just give people a platform to talk about, what they're really good at yep. or what they're really passionate about. And then people can go kind of seek them out even more, you know, beyond that, which I, I love is, is that's what you're doing. Um, but we need to get to know you because I, I just did like a quick bio read on you this morning and I was like, all right, we're just going to like learn everything about Marilyn <laughs> in this episode. Um, so you're, are you a Jersey girl? Yep. For, born and raised cool. in Belmar. Okay. All right. Yeah. So you're like shore all the way. Yep. I saw like a lot, you just said surfing. I saw like a lot of stuff about surfing and different things on your, on your, uh, uh, in your bio on the website. Yeah. Um, but uh, so what was like growing up as like a shore person, like, what was that like? Oh, it was awesome. It was pre-internet, pre-telephones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, get out of the house and go to the beach, yeah. you know, ride your bike, ride your skateboard, walk the dog, do whatever. Like I have kids now and it's like, go outside. <laughs> like this is one planet, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, that yeah. is, changing unfortunately and enjoy it it's my whole life i've been outside yeah and when you live at the beach there's this culture you can go either way you can get real lazy in that or you can want more of it and for me it was always work my ass off and then travel yeah go to school then travel have a summer job save my money and travel and you know, it was for my whole life I've had this kind of thing. I got have to go to one new place every year. Cool. And I can go back to other places that I like. Yeah. But I need a new one every year. And that could be anywhere. Anywhere. Okay. And I have a list. Sure. You know? Of course. We all have lists. <laughs> and I some so of them are lists. small <laughs> and some of them are pretty big. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I said to my kids when we were away, because they don't get it. They don't know how lucky they are yeah. to have parents who want them to see the world and do all these things with them and get them out of the house. And, you know, every time I turn around, they're on the iPad or the phone or TikTok. And they're like, you're going to grow up and you're going to be so grateful yeah. that your parents pushed you to go surfing and snorkeling and hiking and, sure. you know, do the things that a lot of kids don't have an opportunity to do, especially when you don't live in an environment where yeah. you have, you know, like the, the beach is right there. Yeah, right. I'm a North Jersey guy, so we actually had to, like, drive to go to the beach. Yeah. You know, like, at least an hour, wherever we were going. So, And I used know. to work in the city for my brother, and any day off, I would drive back down here just to smell the ocean. Yeah. I literally did that before I came over here. I just, yeah. like, walked over there, just, like, stood on the boardwalk for a little bit, and was like, okay, it's, like, nice to kind of, like have that connection. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we even have seagulls they don't have anywhere else. Yeah. They have a unique sound. Like, yeah. Well, you know, I don't think when you're younger you realize 
how grateful you should be about wherever you live. Sure. What, you know, you always want something more or something else. And I'm really trying to be present in that because I have given up things in life or sold businesses or closed businesses because I thought I needed something else. And I don't have a lot of regrets, but there are a couple in there. Sure. That, you know, Normandy Beach to me was such an amazing place. And I'm always so sad that I, that we got out of there. Yeah. Even though I didn't make any money. <laughs> and it was a struggle and the weather Dude, was... The business thing is such a pain in the ass. The seasonal, yeah. you know, but... This year, I said to my husband, you know what? I like seasonal businesses, maybe because it's all I know. Yeah. And I'm used to that roller coaster, that having a more year-round stable life right. is kind of scary to me. Yeah, you know? totally. So I have to get used to that. Yeah. Was food always something that you were like, like restaurants, like that world? Were you always kind of involved in that from like a young age to, to now? Or was that something that like at some point in your life kind of jumped in and was like, hey, do this now? You know. It happened literally in an hour oh, of my life. Okay. You know, a very important hour, I guess. A very well, yeah. Or whatever. However Good you or want bad. To look at it. Yeah. That's going to be on the side of the venture on. Perspective. Yeah. Um, I wanted to be a marine biologist. That okay. was my dream. I wanted to play with dolphins my whole life, and wanted to go to school for that. Went, got accepted to the University of Miami, and then uh, some things happened in my family and my parents passed away around that time. And my brother had a French-Japanese restaurant in Avon okay. on the marina. And I was a waitress there in the summer. And then I didn't go to college. I would leave in the winter and I'd go to Australia or New Zealand or Central America. I just would get out of here. Yeah. And um, one day the chef didn't show up. And my brother was in New York opening another restaurant with his partner. and. I was like, what do I do? He's like, well, you're going to have to cook. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know? yes. I mean, I grew up in the 80s. That was like my late teen, sure. 20 time. Yeah. And that was processed food, diet soda, Doritos. Yeah. Like, it was like, the you classics. didn't cook. <laughs> yeah. You bought junk yeah. because that was cool. And right. that's what everybody was talking about. So I had no background in culinary whatsoever. But my mother had been sick with cancer at that time, and she was doing a macrobiotic diet that my brother got her into. Mm -hmm. And I saw the way food really could heal you, if you mentally wanted that. Sure. When she wanted to get better and she ate well, she was healthy. When she didn't want to get better, and she didn't eat well, she wasn't healthy. And that, to me, was like, wow, you can do this with a plant. You yeah. can do this with a protein. You don't need to have chemotherapy or drugs. And when I got thrown into the kitchen on that night, it was pre-cell phones, but it was portable phone time. Okay. So we had those big phones. Oh, yeah. yeah. I had it on my shoulder. <laughs> my brother was in New York, and I'm like, what is the tuna supposed to look like? When I when should I turn it over? Yeah. How do I stir the risotto? You know, <laughs> like going through the whole menu. Sure. I knew how it looked on a plate because I served there, right. so I knew what the guests should get, but I didn't know how to get from point A to point C. Yeah. It was like the underpants knows, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Underpants, profit, what happens in the middle, yeah, right. you know? Yeah. Um, and I just fell in love with it. Like, luckily, I had a palate for it, but I loved the energy. I loved the pace of it, the chaos of it yeah. in a controlled way. But then taking that beginning and chaos and then making somebody feel good. Right. And making them... Not feel good because it was mine, but just because you gave them this experience with their friends or their family and this comfort. And when they left, they had a memory that you helped create for them. Yeah. So it wasn't necessarily the food aspect of it. It was the whole way of making a space and staff that cared about the people and the food and putting that all together. Right. And then having you leave being like, that was just a really nice evening. Yeah. I had a great 
start to my day. Totally. That person made me feel good. Yeah. You no. Know? So then like, so you get that itch and then you're like, okay, free at serving now. Like now I want to be in the kitchen. And then I would imagine, at, cause at some point, like you take it to like a totally other level and like really start to immerse yourself in the, in the whole things. Like what was, was it culinary school a thing or was it just kind of learning on the fly and I never went to culinary school. Yeah. I worked for my brother in the city for a while. I really like to learn, Yeah, you know, even now, you know, I just have a thirst for experiences and knowledge and culture. And I want to learn where things come from and why this dish was created, not by the Michelin star chef, but by the grandmother. Yeah. Like, I didn't have that. My parents died when I was 20. I never met my half of my family. My father was um, 30 years older than my mother. Okay. He was 65 when I was born, so he was born in 1898. I only met a few of his nine brother and sisters. Yeah. So I didn't have that culture in my life. Yeah. And I missed it because I saw other people having it. And, you know, when I see, like, Thanksgiving and all these people, like, fighting and having these big meals, it was, I want to fight at Thanksgiving <laughs> with a bunch of people, you know? You it's do sometimes take the fights for granted, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that, like, weird love you have when you're communing with people and over food. And, you know, owning restaurants was never something I thought about or knew anything about. But when my parents died, I was on my own. Sure. I inherited their house, their medical bills, their problems, their business. They were in real estate. Okay. And I was 20 years old. So it was like... It's a lot to dump on, you know. But I got to do you something. You got to figure it out. Right. Yeah. So, you know, there's people who think like... Well, I can't do this or I can't do that because society says it or I've read this or women shouldn't do this. I never really thought about it. I just did it. Yeah. You know, I was driving by a place in Bayhead, saw for sale for rent sign, walked in the back and was like, this is so cute. It looks like France and opened a restaurant. Yeah. Three months later, like I never even cooked a meal that wasn't out of a cookbook. Yeah. That's you know, amazing. We didn't have the internet. Right. I wasn't looking up recipes. <laughs> you know? I was getting books out yeah. and doing it. I, look, I just loved making people feel the things I always wanted to feel that I never had. Right. You know? And it just kept going. And opportunities would come and go. And partnerships would succeed or fail. And I was young. And when you're young, you take a lot of risks. Yeah because you don't know any different. Right. That's the best time to take risks. Yeah. yeah. And I wish I had mentors around me like I'm able to be for other people. Um, but there was nobody. Yeah. I didn't even know another female chef. Yeah, because I feel like at that time, it, especially like in Jersey. No. I mean, was the food scene in Jersey, not that great back then. And I mean, no women, really. No women. There was one in Farmingdale, and there was Alice Waters. We're the only two yeah. that I knew when I started, and then the women from Border Grill in California. But, you know, it was like on one hand sure. you could count this. And I didn't have the experience of this male-dominated field, just like when I got into politics and thought you could do anything because you want to. Yeah. I thought women are going to be all over the restaurant industry because my, the women models I had in my own life were grandmothers that cooked the food, yeah. not grandfathers. Yeah, so never. I was like, where are all the women? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why yeah. are there only men? Right. You know? um, but it didn't bother me, and I didn't like read into it and get all whacked out about it. I just did my job and kept going and trying to make people feel good. Yeah. And, you know, my reputation in the industry from the outside is probably very different than what I think of it on the inside. Sure. Um, you know, I've gotten bashed for having a laid back surfer vibe in my restaurants, but I also don't like to go to fancy restaurants, but I like good food. Yeah. And I like people to treat me well. Yeah. And I don't need a white tablecloth or high heels on to right. do that. Totally. 
Do you think, so you were talking before about like the family dynamic and all that and how like you didn't really have like uh, that kind of like experience, like the one that you wanted. Yeah. But then like the travel side, I think is like a really interesting piece because I mean, people travel for a variety of reasons. Some people do travel for food, but going to all these places and like trying different food, I feel like that is something that people, even if they do have like a family dynamic where the grandmother cook, does all the cooking, that's like, they only have grandma's stuff, you yeah. know, like they don't have necessarily like stuff from, you know, Central America or Asia or like all these different things because it's just not part of their culture, but you kind of like forced culture like down your own throat basically. Yeah, I, I think not going to culinary school and not having a specific background of knowledge enabled me to just do whatever. Yeah. You know, nobody told me, you know, now the food world is very different. People mix cultures and foods together and create experiences that never would have happened 40 years ago. Totally. You know, it was this way or no way. And I didn't have that because I just did whatever. Sure. You know, put the cilantro in the pasta sauce. But it's tomato and yeah. cilantro. Oh, you can't do that because this is Italian and this right. is <laughs> French and this is yeah. Asian. So I, it never, re what I enjoyed about food was where food came from, who grew it, who produced it, how much they cared about it. Because for me, I cared about my guests and the people I was giving an experience to. I also wanted what I was purchasing to come from that too. And there wasn't a farm to table movement back then. Yeah. I mean, Alice Waters literally created that in California where you have 12 months of the year, abundant produce and seafood. And we're in New Jersey, you know, six months of the year, it's barren here. Yeah. But in the six months that we have it, it's amazing. Sure. Guard state. Yeah. Yeah. And we lost that for yeah. decades. And finally, it's coming back. And I think it's awesome that people are playing around with different foods here. You know, when we bought our house in the DR, the first thing I did was look at what plants were on the property. Like we have mango trees and guava trees and um, different plants. And because we bought our house from a chef okay. who passed away and we bought it from the estate. Yeah. And, you know, it was like kind of a kindred thing that we bought a house in another country that was a chef's house. Sure. Because you walk in and you're like... Chef you know, yeah. there's pots and pans yeah. and tons of dishes right. and plants everywhere and, you know, very different setup than normal people's house. <laughs> you know? Normal people, um, yeah. So, you know, but that was the first thing I wanted to know was, you know, what can we grow on our land? Like sure. every time we, I planted oregano this time, last time we planted lime trees and chinola trees and uh, avocado tree. Like I just want to be able to go there and, and have these things in my yard because they're there all year. Sure. You know? Yeah. And my kids are like, well, why can't I get mango juice? And I'm like, because it's on season. And these people don't bring it from Mexico or California. If they don't grow it here, they're not having it. Yeah. So have tamarind juice or passion fruit juice because that's in season. Sure. So it's, you know, this like you come back from a trip and it's like Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Small Saturday. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, holy, holy crap, like, I don't, I didn't even watch TV last week. Yeah. I don't want to buy anything. Right, right. Like, I, I just want to not want so much anymore. Yeah. And help other people do what they want to do. Totally. You know? Yeah. Um, we got time for one more. So, uh, like, you start the first restaurant, uh, which you said was in, where would you say that was? Avon. Avon. Yeah. Um, and then, like, from there... Like, how many places have you opened since then till now? I'm just curious. A bunch? A bunch. Yeah. We don't have to put, like, an actual number on it, but a bunch. It's a lot. Yeah. And a lot of them didn't work out for different reasons, sure. whether it was, you know, partnership, real estate, um, boredom. Yeah. Uh, you know, creative people, like, if I was an artist and I painted the same exact picture for 20 years... Or I was a musician and I sang the same song every night for my for 300 days a year yeah. for 20 years. I would say you're crazy. lose your mind. Yeah, crazy. Totally. You know, so 
You know, Langosta was probably the longest stretch yeah. that I had, um, only because it was on the beach. And, God, I could sit and have this, and the ocean would be in front of me. Yeah, which and, is incredible. You know, my office, my laptop, I see a dolphin run outside, Yeah. you know, in the morning, get to have my coffee. That I miss. But if that wasn't on the ocean, I don't think I would have stayed there 20 years. Sure. You know, besides the fact, the rent and the crazy expense. Oh, yeah. You know, it, it, the allure of it was where I was. And, you know, I've had some not so great partnerships because when you, I think when you become more mature in life, you realize what you're good at and you're not so scared to say that anymore and you have more confidence in what you can do and also what you want to do. And you're not willing to to do more than that sure. to get something. Yeah, you don't need so much anymore. Yeah, creatively or financially or otherwise. Um, and I think I sold my soul too many times, thinking I wasn't good enough, and that somebody was better than me because they had the money or they had the space or they had the knowledge. And then I came to the realization: I work hard and. If I put myself into something, I do it yeah. full on. And I can't do that effectively in 10 places. Right. At one point, we had nine businesses operating. That's a, that's a lot. Yeah. yeah. And I'm hands-on. Sure. not the person who's like off saying, and maybe that's good or bad. Some people didn't like working with me because I was too hands-on. Some people loved it. Um, I also wasn't very good at choosing who the best people to have around me were <laughs> sure. all the time. Yeah, which is a skill in, yeah. in and of itself. Yeah. yeah, and it's okay. You don't have to, you know. Right. You do you and I do me, and sometimes we do that together, and sometimes that doesn't work out. And, you know, I think if I didn't make so many mistakes along the way, I wouldn't be who I am. Sure. And I hope I help some people become better them. Yeah. By the mistakes they made with me. Totally. You know? Yeah. Um, no, this has been great so far. So we're going to have to take our break just because we're bumping up on time. Uh, so we'll come back. And I do. I have one question that I think is I, I'm very interested to ask you when we come back. But uh, so this is the Greetings from the Garcia podcast powered by the New Jersey Lottery. I forgot to say that at the beginning. So sorry to the lottery. But we're here in uh, Long Branch, New Jersey at the Whitechapel Project with Marilyn Schlossbach. We'll be right back. The Mail Performing Arts Center is the heart of arts and entertainment in Morristown, New Jersey. MPAC presents over 200 events annually and is home to an innovative children's arts education program. To see MPAC's upcoming schedule of world-class concerts, stand-up comedy, family shows, and more, head to mayoarts.org or just click the link in our show notes. Want to give your guests something they'll talk about for years? OMG Tarot delivers spot-on tarot card readings that will make your next birthday party, holiday party, team lunch, or girls' night unforgettable. To learn more, visit omgtarot.com. Hey folks, I want to tell you about the crew over at Make Cool Shit. These are the magicians who recently gave our podcast a jaw-dropping makeover. You know how we roll here at Greetings of the Garden State Podcast, right? We're all about that Garden State attitude. Well, Make Cool Shit shares that same vibe, and they've got something absolutely epic to offer. It's called the Unlimited Cool Shit Design Subscription. It's a game changer, my friends. Imagine this, unlimited creativity, one flat monthly fee, and none of that boring stuff. It's like having your very own army of design superheroes on speed dial. Whether you're a fresh race startup or a seasoned business looking to shake things up, the team at Make Cool Shit has got your back. It's all about making your brand sizzle no matter where you are in your journey. So if you're ready to turn your ideas into mind-blowing realities, then it's time to connect with Make Cool Shit. To check them out on Instagram at, at @wemakecoolshit or visit their website, wemakecoolshit.co. Remember, that's co, not com. Greetings from the Garden State is proud to be partnered with some amazing brands. A special thanks to La Grand Coffee House, our official coffee, and Birdling, our official travel bag. To learn more about these and all of our other great sponsors, head to greetingsfromthegardenstate.com. All right, we're back for segment two of this episode of Greetings from the Garden State, powered by the New Jersey Lottery. I'm Mike Ham. We're here at Long Branch, New Jersey at the Whitechapel Projects with Marilyn Schlossbach. So first segment, we learned all about uh, you, basically, like your background, how you got into this, uh, you're, you know, basically just kind of getting thrown into the kitchen and then starting a whole bunch of restaurants all around the state. So as so this is the question that I uh, kind of teased at the end of the last segment. I'm really curious because you said you grew up in Belmar. 
and you had places in Asbury, you know, uh, you have this place here in Long Branch, like Jersey Shore, like if we cut you open, there's probably like ocean water that's coming out of you, the Jersey Shore ocean water. Like to me, the Jersey Shore, especially some of those places that we're talking about, like Asbury and especially Long Branch here too, like have gone through such like a incredible transformation like over time and you kind of have like had the opportunity to kind of watch that. Like what's that been like to kind of go from, you know, like Asbury is a place I go to once a month minimum. And it's like, I know when I was a kid, we just didn't go because you just didn't do that. And then like now it's like, I can't get enough. Like I just need to be there like all the time. So like in your, from your perspective, kind of take me through like that, like all those transfer transformations to it uh, in a sense. It's a hard question, a very deep question. Yeah. I mean, I used to come to Asbury when I was like 16 before I was legal to drink, sure. and go to roller skate or skateboard to the fast lane or to convention hall and see bands. And, you know, this was kind of our underground hangout spot. There were a lot of pools that were empty in people's yards or in hotels and we would skate. And there was a culture here that was pretty under the radar. And my dad was in real estate, so he was involved in Asbury quite a bit back in the day. And it always, like, to me, it was like, why isn't something happening here? Sure. It's oceanfront town, you yeah. know? And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in New York. I worked for my brother up there. I went to school briefly up there. I'm not a city person, you know, two days in the city. We were just in France, two days in Paris, and two weeks at the coast. Yeah. You know, that's enough for me. But... Um, the uniqueness of some of these towns by the beach is that you get that urban feeling sure. and that combination of city and urban life. But I also love Normandy Beach, where we had our restaurant, which is total beach town. Summertime only. Kids are at the beach all day. They surf, they paddleboard, they kayak, and then they come in for dinner and go to bed. Yeah. No nightlife, no restaurants. We were the only restaurant in a one mile radius. We're here in Long Branch or Asbury, there's a restaurant after restaurant. Sure. And when Asbury first started and I first got into business there, it was a really like intense energy of people, grassroots, trying to start something, trying to do things out of the box, you know, we would do this thing that I loved called Style Council. And it was a bunch of us that had different businesses. There was a realtor involved, an art gallery, uh, I was the restaurant, a DJ, a clothing store, and we would set up in like a condo or a house and we would have a party. And there were clothes in the closet from the clothing store. There was books on the table from the bookstore. Yeah. And we would throw these style council parties and people would come and look at the property to buy the house and learn about all the different businesses in town. Yeah. We just used to do like really cool stuff back then. And I think for me, it's the excitement of the startup of a community and being part of the energy of that, of bringing people together, of doing it with others, not being the only one. Yeah that's putting themselves out there, that you have a group of people and you are helping each other. Because if I don't succeed, you don't just succeed and vice versa. If yeah. you're busy, I'm, I'm busy. Right. You know, it's not one person can survive. I mean, if we didn't learn that in Sandy around here yeah. and when everybody was gone, <laughs> yeah. how lonely that feels. Sure. That you need a community of business. You know, for me, it gets to a point where I wouldn't say gentrify because Asbury's not. I still live there. My kids go to school there. Um, there's always going to be a mix of culture there because it's too big to gentrify the whole thing. Yeah. But parts of it get do there. get that way. Yeah, for sure. And to be able to do business at that price point, you have to like sacrifice some of your passion and creativity. Sure. And that's where, for me, I couldn't do what I wanted to do the way I wanted to do it without a lot of dumbing down 
my product, my service, yeah, all of it, yeah, and my bank account, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, and Long Branch to me is very different. You know, it's it's not. Asbury had this like community downtown before the boardwalk. Right. Where they were all on Cookman Avenue, and it felt really small, and you knew your neighbors. And then the boardwalk happened, and and now like I don't know as many people anymore, and it's very, it's more touristy feeling to me yeah. than it used to be. Definitely. Um, Long Branch has this like really diverse community, more so than Asbury. The really? Portuguese, the Latinos, the African Americans, <clears throat> the condos on the beach, the Syrians. Yeah. Like it, it's way bigger culturally than I thought it was when I came in here, which is very interesting. Yeah. You know, it's like I can go get pupusas across the street. And, a rape was down the street, which right. are basically the same thing, but different cultures, yeah. you know? <laughs> it's weird how food works that yeah. way. Yeah. And that's cool to me. It's a little overwhelming here. You know, it's hard to connect the dots because there are so many people right. doing so much in Long yeah. Branch, and it's a big, it's a lot bigger than Asbury. So that I'm trying to maneuver and trying to bring more people into this situation to get to know the community. Yeah. Because... Part of what I've always done is help the community. This is the first year in 17 years we're not doing Christmas dinner in the restaurant. Okay. And my kids are like, well, what are we going to do for Christmas? Yeah. We've never <laughs> yeah. done Christmas at home. We've always had a big dinner for the community. So I'm a little out of sorts in that. Yeah. You know, we're going to donate it to Asbury to Trinity, but... I don't know, you know, how long will it take to maneuver into that? Because next year I want to do Christmas here. Yeah. I want to feed the community. I want to get to know the community. I like being a person the community can rely on for what they need, whether it's another restaurant or a church or the Boys and Girls Club. Like, I, that makes me feel good to be able to help other people. Absolutely. And I'm missing that so far here. Yes. And trying to... Well, just finding, like, your footing almost yeah. a little bit. Um, and, like, finding, like, your your lane yeah. to a degree. And, like, that is one of the things that I think is super interesting about you. And you talk about, like, community and, like, ways that you can help and, like, do things with the community. Um, and, like, someone that can, the community can rely on. Uh, and like that's one of the things that I told you at the beginning, like we were kind of going through our topics, sort of. Um, like I did want to talk a little bit about kind of the uh, like the nonprofit stuff that you do, because there's several that you're involved in that you run. Um, so like, what what are they? So people know. So we have our own. It's called Food for Thought by the Sea, and basically it's a literal vehicle to help other nonprofits. Great. So we have a food truck. We work with the Boys and Girls Club, Interfaith Neighbors, Surfrider, and lots of different organizations. Um, being more of a conduit to help other people, we don't do one thing. Like sure. We're not building houses. or. But you could. But we could. Yeah. If somebody needed us to bring the truck and raise some money and awareness for building houses, we're happy to do that. We work a lot with kids because I think that that's how we can change the world. Yeah. You know, people my age are already set. You know, luckily I'm set in changing the world, yeah. but not everybody is. Right, totally. Um, and, you know, working with other, you know, other restaurants. Like, you brought up Chris Calabrese earlier. He had asked me to be part of the Red Gables. I was so excited. Me too. Oh, my God. Because I was so wanting to meet all these people in my industry, younger people who are doing all these great things and, like, have that like TV camaraderie of working with other chefs that really doesn't happen because we're all so busy. Yeah. And, you know, I was so honored to be part of that. And next year, I hope I am again. Yeah. But things like that are funny because people, especially in our industry, they're so cutthroat and worried about how they're going to make their next dollar, which is difficult to make in hospitality. I don't think they always trust that I just really want to help people and yeah. get to know people. Right. I think people look at it almost as like a zero-sum game. So, like, if they come here, they're not there eating. But it's, like, at the same time, if, you, like, if this place is doing really well and, you know, Pure Village and all the stuff going on down there is yeah. just, like, continues to elevate 
you know, all the stuff going on around it, uh, like the rising tides thing. Yeah. You know, so or like if you want to do some side gig, like yeah. musicians do it all the time. They have like this solo album or this other band they're in right. where they get to collaborate with other people and do something off brand of what they normally do. It's the same in the nonprofit because nonprofits need money. Yeah. And there's not a lot of money going around, especially now. Right. So nonprofits are all wanting to get the money. My nonprofit wants to get the money to give you the money. Right. Or give you the support you need. Because we don't really do anything. We don't need any money unless you need it. Sure. And then I got to raise it. Like we're doing a grant with the Boys and Girls Club. It's to help the kids. So I got to raise the money to help the kids. But if I didn't have that program, I don't need any money. I don't have any staff. No yeah. one gets paid. Right. You know, yeah. Unless I need to make money for you. Yeah. So that's really what Food for Thought is all about. We... Started with community meals, and then I was like, well, to get money from people, they want a tax write-off. They want to know it's going somewhere. So I guess we should start a nonprofit so we can feed people. Yeah. And then we really didn't need too much money to do that. So if we raised $500 a year, it was like, great. You know, now we're doing bigger programs, so we need to raise more money. But for me, it's like, I don't, I don't want to raise money. I just want to do stuff. Yeah. Just can't the money just yeah. be there? Can't somebody give me the lottery and then I can just do the stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, I guess I know people. But, uh, no, I think that's really interesting because, like you said, also in that answer, that people in the culinary world, especially now, like everyone's so busy that it's like you just get sometimes with everything, you know, culinary especially, but like you kind of get caught on like the hamster wheel of like, you know, if you're open six, seven days a week, you're just like, especially, you know, staff shortages and seasonality of like short town restaurants and like all that kind of stuff. It's like you wind up being there, like in it, like with your head in the sand, like the whole time without ever like kind of coming up for air and doing stuff that's important yeah, to you. Or your family. Yeah. Like when my daughter said to me one day, what are you doing at home? You're never home. Yeah. That was a real eye opener that, you know, my kids are 11. I had kids at a later age. But for seven of those years, I was never home. Sure. You know, and that was the impetus to kind of downsize some things and prioritize, like, 20 years from now, am I going to look back and be like, oh, you're in college now. Where did the time go? Yeah. I want to know where the time went. I want to be a part of the time. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, so, but you're, and you're also involved in like a bunch of other ones too, right? Or like, so you support them or whatever, because yep. I thought there was like one, there was a surfing one, I think. Surf rider we do a lot of work with. Yep. Um, Asray Park Surf Club. Uh, I work with the Restaurant Association, was on their board for a while. I'm a charter board for my kid's school. I tend to say yes too much. <laughs> it, seems, it seems like you say yes a lot, yeah. <laughs> and get involved, only because I really want to know what's going on. Yeah. You know, I really want to know that these organizations, whether it's a charter school or a nonprofit, are doing what they say they're going to do, and how can I help them? Right. And sometimes I can't. Sometimes it's money. Here, I'll give you a little bit of money, and sometimes it's time. I think people don't realize how valuable time is to helping people. You know, a lot of people will call, oh, I want to help, but I don't have any money. Well, come volunteer. Yeah. Like, we're doing a beach sweep, or, you know, so-and-so needs help smashing pumpkins today, or whatever. <laughs> like, there's always something going on that you can get involved in. You just, for me, it was for a while, there were too many things and I had to say, what are the most valuable things to me for my values? And let me just get involved in those right now. Yeah. I think that's really interesting, too, uh, just because it's like saying yes a lot is like I, I'm always like, yeah, I'll do it. And then I'm like, oh, shit, that's in like way south Jersey. I have to drive like two and a half hours to go do it. But it's, you know, it's important for me because yeah. like to get to know different parts of Jersey and like different communities and different businesses and all that kind of stuff. It just, you know, you wind up taking on a lot. But at the same time, it can be like rewarding too because you get to, you know, experience some things that otherwise if you had said no, you never get to experience exactly. it. But uh, so I, I mean, like one of my last questions for you is, I'm really interested in kind of like like your background, like in surfing, like you talked about like skating and doing different things like that, like uh, like the travel and all these other things. Do you think that that 
like those types of things are like influential in the way that kind of you like uh, like your food and the restaurants that you open, like the, the vibes of those restaurants, like all that kind of stuff. Like how, how much of an impact do you think like other things that you do outside of the kitchen impact kind of how you run your, your places? Absolutely. I think, you know, growing up, there was like the deadheads and the punk people and the, you know, the people went to disco, you know, all, and I did all of them. Yeah, okay. Like, you know, I, I loved the Grateful Dead. I would go to dead shows. I also loved going to the fast lane and seeing a punk show. I, music, food to me has never been in a box. Like my daughter said the other day, well, I used to be a preppy and now I'm not. She's 11. <laughs> <laughs> First off, so you don't even know what that is. Yeah, right. <laughs> Why can't you be all of it? Yeah. Why can't you be emo and prep? Why, do you, if you like black eyeliner, you can still wear a rugby shirt? Like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, you don't have to choose one or the other. And I think the vibe I've always wanted in my places is that everybody can feel comfortable there and that I'm not just one thing. Yeah. You know, and musically on the boardwalk, you know, Peter Mantis and I go way back. He booked all our music. Now he's booking for them. You know, he knew me when I was young and I would show up at the Stone Pony and for all kinds of shows. Like, I think musicians are highly underpaid, just like chefs. Yep. And can bring so much creativity and feeling to the world. And even if I don't necessarily love the music, I respect the process. Sure, totally. And I've always wanted to support that wherever we are. And that's with artists and painters. My husband's an artist, and, you know, he gives his soul to what he does, you know, and he never gets paid enough for it. I'm always like, really? You're still charging that for... You've been working on this thing for a month. You know, yeah. it's just... You do it because you love it. Right. And I, I want people to come into our venues and feel something. Some people get it. Some people don't. You know, not everybody's our customer. You know, there's plenty of places to go. Sure. And plenty of interesting music, food, art, theater, all of it. I just, for selfish reasons, can't go do all these things. So I'm hoping they come to us a little bit <laughs> so I can yeah. show up and exactly. see them or right. feel them or work. taste them. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then, no, it's really interesting. And it's like, it just, like I said before, like APYC was a place that like, I, you know, saw like the Vaughns for the first time and they, we, we've seen them like five times since then. And they're just like a local Asbury band and yeah. you know, that's great. And we've like, uh, my girlfriend was talking to them at like a show at the pet shop in Jersey city, just like hanging out with, you know, uh, with them. But, uh, no, I think this has been so cool and like such a cool experience, like talking to you and getting to know you a little bit more and kind of just like all the stuff that kind of goes into the places that I know that you have and, and all that. So before we wrap it up, just so I want to make sure that people know, like, is this the only spot you have right now? Right now. Yeah. Okay. And it's, uh, it's complicated. We do a lot of events here. We're shut down a lot. So we're yeah. expanding, putting another kitchen in okay. so we can stay open to the public more sure. when we're closed for a wedding. Um, I'm sure I'll open something. My husband even says to me like almost every week, are you itching? Are you itching? Because he's the like one who wants yes. a lot less. Yeah, right. Yeah. You totally. know, like we're down in the DR. He's like, we could open up the garage and serve empanadas and mango margaritas. And I'm like, we? <laughs> you need me. Right. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I'm ready to do that yet. <laughs> you know? um, no, it's just, it's, it's so interesting. And it's like, uh, we've had... I don't know how many chefs on the show at this point. And it's like, to me, it's so interested, interesting to see kind of like the, the route that people take to get from like where they started to where they are now and like all the different influences, like whether it was culinary school or like whether it was working at like, you know, going through Europe and working in Paris and London, like all these other places. And then like we mentioned, well, I'll mention Chris again, like he started at just like a dive bar, basically he just got dragged into the kitchen one time, had never cooked before and boom, now he has a restaurant. Um, and it just like, it, to me, it's like so interesting to kind of see what goes into, cause it is a very creative field. Yeah. Like you're creating food and experiences for people to come and like talk about for like the rest of their life in some cases. Um, and I, so I really appreciate you sharing all that stuff with us today. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so if people want to learn more about you, 
Uh, where can they go to do that? So White Chapel Projects is our website for this location. My name, Marilyn Sloshback, is my website because I also have a wellness or beauty brand I'm launching, okay. which has been a real passion project for me lately. Cool. And that's starting to take off and hoping that that becomes something in my Buddhist teaching, my cup needs to run us over again. Okay. And I'm hoping this is the thing that fills my cup, not just financially, but from a personal fulfillment. Yeah. Um, restaurants are tough and I'm tired of all the people and the things all the time and the chaos. Um, I want something that is a little more sustainable for me. Yeah. Um, and I think that the next step of what I want for my kids is a more conscious effort to create a better planet for them so that when they're my age, they can still enjoy going outside yeah. and, and getting in the water right. and smelling, you know, the mussels on the beach, you know, and I'm not so sure that that will happen unless more people get involved in the next steps of what the planet looks like. Yeah. So my product, Ocean Oil, is part of that sustainability that I've always gotten behind. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. And they can get all those from, from my website, from your website. Slosbeck. Yes. German. I fucked it up the whole time. You didn't even tell <laughs> well, me. Well, my dad says it Sloshbach and my mother said Sloshbach. Oh, okay. All right. Now I feel can't, less bad. Can't mess it up. <laughs> uh, no, but again, so I really appreciate you, you jumping out with us and, you know, given some of your obviously busy schedule to the show, uh, we're going to put the website stuff in the show notes. People just go click it uh, and go learn more and then come down here, like, you know, for an event or just to, you know, see what it's all about down down here in Long Branch. Uh, greetings from the Garden State .com is a website for the show. So we'll have this episode and all of our other episodes at this point. Well, like probably like 110 at this point. Um, so those will be there for you to listen to, check out. Uh, again, Marilyn, thank you so much for doing this with us today. Um, this has been the Greetings from the Garden State podcast, powered by the New Jersey Lottery. We were here in Long Branch, New Jersey, at the White Chapel Project with Marilyn Schlossbeck. Thank you for listening, and we'll catch you next time.